Aloha, everyone, and welcome to the 2020 Statewide Homeless Veterans Virtual Conference. This is the Being Data Driven Session Evidence and Guidance. Our panelists today are Michael Kleiber, Joshua Fuentes, and Wallace Engberg. And I'm just going to hand it over to them right now. Thank you very much, Ryan. I appreciate that. Thank you again, everyone, for being here. I really appreciate it. Uh, so, our presentation is on uh, is being data driven and evidence as guidance. Uh, my name is Michael Kleiber, and uh, we are representatives of uh, Partners in Care, which is the continuum of care for Oahu. We coordinate homeless services uh, and organizations across the state. Uh, we encourage anyone who's interested to go to our website, partnersincareoahu.org. Um, so. Our panelists today, so I'll start uh, myself. I uh, just finished a C, uh, VISTA year with the CES team and am continuing to work with Partners in Care, now uh, dividing my time between the CES team and the HMIS team. Wallace, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Sure. So I work with doing research and planning, so mainly focused around the Oahu Point in Time Count and on then working a lot with HMIS and anything that is data or research driven from the continuum. And Josh? Awesome. Hi, everybody. I'm Josh Fuentes. I work with the HMIS team over at PIC, and I've been there since Christmas time about. And I've primarily been in charge of the help desk. I've also assisted with a lot of training, and I do a lot of um, data quality monitoring and all kinds of fun projects. Thank you. Uh, so the first uh, section of this presentation, we're going to concentrate on the point in time count, and specifically the veterans' uh, information from that. So with that, I will hand it over to Wallace. Great. Um, so I'm just going to do a very quick overview of the Oahu Point in Time count just as a refresher. Um, so this year we conducted a count on the 23rd of January 2020 um, between the hours of 4 a.m. and 11 a.m. Uh, this is drastically different from previous years as before we had done it over um, several days and varying times in different regions. So from that one day count, we have 4,448 individuals um, who are experiencing homelessness on the night of January 23rd. 2,102 were living in our emergency shelters, safe havens, and traditional housing. And then 2,346 of those individuals um, were living unsheltered, so in tents, cars, places not meant for human habitation. Now, out of all of those over 4,000 people, 356 indicated that they were veterans. Um, and this is roughly about 10% of our adult population from the point in time count. So what do those 356 veterans look like? Well, we can see that the majority of them were sheltered, um, 210 or 59%, and then 41% 40, were living unsheltered. And in terms of gender, so if you look at the donut graph on the far right, we can see, as most of you might assume, that the majority are male at 88%, and then 10% of those um, that identified as female, and then just 1% as transgender or gender nonconforming. And then in the center, which I think is really interesting, is we can see those kind of changes over time. So we do have um, previous data from our point in time count. And so from 2019 to 2020, we can see that the total veteran population has decreased by 7%. Um, and then if we take that even further back, so if we look at the past five years, we can actually see that the veteran population has decreased by 24% over the past five years, which is really promising um, and, um, and really cool to see that, that we are decreasing um, that veteran population. So we can see in those two little um, cubes to the right of the total veteran population, our unsheltered count has decreased since last year, and our sheltered count has increased. Um, so that, that coincides with 
um, where our population is um, in sheltered and unsheltered. We are moving more people into our shelters. And then with the overall decrease, that indicates that we are, we're moving more people into permanent housing um, and away from homelessness. Now, how does this break down? So we have the overall numbers where they are. What about the differences between sheltered and unsheltered? So for the remainder of the, um, the graphs and the diagrams, there's when they're split into two colors, the blue indicates our sheltered population and the coral in, indicates our unsheltered population. So in terms of household structure, um, as many of you might expect, or maybe it was just me who expected it, um, a lot of them are single adults. So the majority of our veteran population is, is single adults. Um, but I think it's really cool when you actually go and we split them from shelter and sheltered, you can see that there's quite a bit of adults in adult only households. Um, so no children, just two or more adults living together as a family. Um, so there is many more in the unsheltered population who are living in those adult family house, adult only households. And then if we look over at the compounded bar graph on the right for age, we can see that the majority of our population is older. Um, most of the veterans are above the age of 50. The majority of our unsheltered population is between the ages of 50 and 59. And then the largest percentage of our unsheltered population, or sheltered population, sorry, is um, above the age of 60. So this graph looks at race, and there's a lot going on. So we're going to kind of go through it step by step. Um, so we're going to actually go down to the bottom bar graph, down at the very bottom. The third one says race, race and ethnicity for the Oahu population. So this is based off of the census data, and we can see that Overall, on the island of Oahu, 42% of the population identify as Asian. And then the second largest would be multiracial in the green, and then white at 21%. Now, if we go up to the middle graph, this is looking at race and ethnicity for all of the point in time count, so for all those 4,448 people. The largest percentage is Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander at 31% and then multiracial at 25%, and then finally white at 16. So we can see it's really different from all of Oahu to the point in time count. Um, our homeless population looks drastically different than our island population. And then finally, when we go up and we narrow further down into our homeless population from the point in time count, on the top graph, we have the veteran population. So the majority is 33% at white, and then 21% at multiracial, and then Black and African American and Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander are tied at 15%. And for me, kind of the, the point that I find really interesting is the fact that 15% of our homeless veterans identify as Black or African American, whereas they only make up 3% of the overall Oahu population. Um, so they're overrepresented by 500%, Within our, um, within our homeless veteran population. And they're overrepresented by 300% just when compared to the pit count population. Um, so I think that's a really interesting um, change in the demog racial demographics of our population we're looking at. So what about health? So as part of the point in time count, we ask different questions about health conditions to determine chronicity, um, and then just also, you know, things that are important in terms of when we're looking at housing um, and referrals and all the other bits. So when we look at the veteran population from the point in time count versus the overall point in time count population, we can see that they have a higher percentage of being chronically homeless, have higher rates of disabling conditions. Um, so we can see especially drastically is those who have disabling conditions among the veteran population, 80%. Um, that's double the point in time count. Um, and they have on average 2.2 disabling conditions with the point in, count, point in time count being 1.9. Not a huge difference, but still, um, they are, have, have slightly more disabling conditions per person. 
And then when we look at disability, it's also double in the veteran um, population as compared to the point in time count. And then serious mental illness is also double. And then substance use disorder is elevated as well. So we can see that the veteran population has a lot more health issues and not necessarily um, tied to chronicity alone, just there's a really high incidence of disabling conditions among this population. Um, but I want to take it one step further. How does this look if we look at the unsheltered versus the sheltered? Is it the same or are there differences between those two? So this slide is looking at our shelter population versus our unsheltered population within the veterans, um, looking at specifically at health. So again, the blue on the top is our shelter and the coral on the bottom is unsheltered. So just looking at those top bars, we can see that 85% of sheltered adults um, indicated a disabling condition, where 72% of our unsheltered. Um, so about a 13% difference um, and higher acuity in our shelter population. But the one point that I think is really startling is if you follow that sentence along, those big bold numbers, um, the shelter population on average has 2.2 disabling conditions um, per adult, whereas our unsheltered veterans have 1.2 disabling conditions per, on average per adult. Um, so our shelter population on average has one more disabling condition, um, which, is, which is pretty huge. So looking at the icons, we can see that there's more chronically homeless um, individuals in our unsheltered. This is also part and due to the fact that individuals who are listed in transitional housing in the shelter, um, for the data standpoint, they're not considered as chronically homeless at that point. Um, so this is really only looking at our emergency shelter and safe haven individuals. But the two graphs to the right um, I want to draw your attention to is when we're looking at mental health problem or serious mental health illness, the sheltered individuals have twice the rate that the unsheltered individuals do. So 85% for our sheltered and 43% for our unsheltered. So mental health illness is much higher in our sheltered veterans. And then when we look at disability, so physical, developmental, chronic illness, any of those kind of inclusive disabilities, 70% um, of our sheltered individuals um, indicate a disability, whereas only 47% um, among our unsheltered. While, yes, those numbers are still quite high in our unsheltered population, um, they're much higher in our sheltered population. Interestingly, substance use um, is about the same in our sheltered and unsheltered population. So what this data could suggest is that we are moving those people who have higher disability or higher acuity into our shelters more quickly so they're not on the street. And so all this information and report um, and the subsequent reports that we pulled this from are available on our website through the Boynton Time Count Report. And then also we have a veteran sub report um, and they can be found at the hyperlink below. And that's what I got. Awesome. Thank you, Wallace. <laughs> that was super interesting. Mahalo for putting all that together. Um, this is Josh here um, from the HMIS team. And I'm going to be talking a little bit about some of the data side of things. Um, so just to harken back to the title of our, our presentation here, being data driven and using evidence as guidance. <clears throat> the data itself um, serves multiple purposes in working towards achieving our shared goals. Uh, in this case, uh, helping a lot loose house, houseless population find pathways to safe, stable, healthy, permanent housing. Uh, we would like to just take a couple of moments to appreciate um, those that contribute to the data collection process and briefly just talk, take a closer look uh, at the data management side of our awesome HMIS system and team. Uh, the life cycle of data from those out in the field that are capturing this invaluable information to the hardworking staff that are inputting this data into the HMIS database, and then those that help manage um, that data and provide 
a solid means of analysis, um, via reporting and visualizing this into something tangible and applicable and digestible for planning, monitoring, accountability, um, making action plans. The many contributors that utilize our uh, homeless management information system construct uh, this important wealth of data. Uh, as data moves through this system, uh, getting handled by all the different players along the way, um, there will always exist a risk for error. Um, the more hands in the pot, the more likely it's going to happen. Uh, there will be missing data um, inaccuracies, and there's always room for improvement. Um, data is fallible. It's not always perfect, and understanding this is part of the process of being responsible stewards of the information age. And in part, this is where the HMIS team at Partners in Care comes into the picture. Being data-driven means caring about the quality of your data, and this type of work does present unique data challenges. Because a significant amount of this info is self-reported, um, from service provider intakes to assessment tools like the BS for that, because this data is self-reported um, by the individual, that requires a certain level of trust between the client and the staff if accurate data is going to be collected. Uh, this often leads to what HUD and case managers refer to as record building within our HMIS. Um, you start out with a little bit of information, and over time, as uh, trust and a willingness to engage is constructed, that data is built upon. An example of, the, of this record building might look something like this slide. Um, a first interaction with the client during an outreach, for example, um, might not collect a lot of data, so sometimes descriptors or aliases might be used, uh, such as a location and um, what the individual looked like or was wearing. Some demographics are guessed um, by observation, and once trust and a collaborative relationship is established over time, more accurate data can be presented. Because of this stage of data collection, can mean starting records based on very little information, navigating back to those records uh, takes diligence and training to avoid duplication and other data dangers. Um, our HMIS team at Partners in Care, along with a strong support network of service providers, have worked hard to establish and provide reliable training for our data collection and data entry staff as well as having data quality reporting functionality for agency administrators and regular DT reports that uh, we can run from the HMIS side of the back end. Deduplication is uh, one example of a large effort on our part to have the most accurate numbers. This process um, involves users reporting to us when they find suspected duplicated records as well as our team running routine reports on newly created clients and checking them for redundancies. As a matter of context, uh, duplicates can, of course, impact reporting numbers, but they also impact the clients themselves. Just as a quick example, say a client from US Vets meets the criteria for permanent supportive housing. Uh, one of the next critical steps is getting them document ready, meaning they have to have all the necessary paperwork like copies of identification, verification letters, healthcare coverage. Um, if this client has more than one record in the database, it's possible those documents are not going to be in the same place. Um, so, so to speak, it's going to be dispersed among the duplicates. Uh, part of the process of managing duplicates means merging and consolidating records into one place which sounds simple, but can really get quite complicated the more household members that are involved, um, as well as significant enrollment history. This emphasizes the importance of having adequate training provided to our users, as well as having accessible and responsive help desk to answer questions and solve database issues as they arise. Uh, prior to COVID-19, we were able to have regular in-person trainings for our users uh, because that is not ideal under current circumstances. Um, we at Partners in Care, like many others, have taken the time, this time as an opportunity to broaden our trainings by creating a helpful video library that covers numerous topics from navigation to funder data requirements, um, as well as move our regular trainings to a webinar form. 
And although this is missing the benefit of a personal face-to-face -face interaction, it has granted us a new level of accessibility and flexibility um, that many of our users are able to benefit from. This slide is just a snapshot of our PIC website um, where we have a lot of resources available. Since the change in keeping up with growing staff for service providers, we have still managed to complete over 160 HMIS trainings since April. That includes 70 plus um, case management trainings, 55 trainings for BI SPDAT, 20 refreshers, uh, 15 training sessions specific to agency administrators or research and read only roles. Timeliness. In regards to other uh, data quality measures um, that we practice, uh, that would include data timeliness. So some funders have strict compliance standards in place designed to ensure data accuracy by asking that all client data collected be entered into the HMIS within 72 hours um, from initial acquisition. We as a COC in general operate by this expectation. And even if agencies are not required by their funder, we encourage them to strive for the 72 hour window. Timeliness reporting is a tool made available to agency administrators as well as um, other types of operational reports. Um, our internal baseline data quality report looks closely at incomplete or missing data, um, including relationships to headholds, households. Um, so as I was saying, uh, relationships to heads of household, location, disabling conditions, um, prior living situation. Uh, these data points are critical and fall under HUD's universal data elements or UDEs. And um, these are basically used to determine chronicity. Um, in other words, um, if a client is considered chronically homeless. Um, in this slide, we see a sample table, or in the previous slide, um, of timeliness. Um, and how it was basically when the data was entered into HMIS, it kind of compares um, the enrollment, the time the enrollment started versus when it was entered and lets us know um, where we're falling between it within that 72 hour um, data standard. Uh, we also look at data issues with overlapping enrollments, duplicate enrollments, sharing, status errors, program exits, pending assessments, on and on. Again, the purpose of all of this is to be respectful of the data and produce as accurate and current an analysis or projection as possible. Um, in this example of a data quality report, we can see a total number of persons served over a window of time and a uh, de-identified breakdown. We can see age groups, we can see leavers versus stayers. Um, in other words, clients that were enrolled and are still enrolled in a particular program versus those that have been exited. In the Q2 table um, below, we can see an error rate for PII, personal identifiable, identifiable info, um, like demographics shown here. Anytime a staff member enters data not collected or leaves a required field blank, that's in indicated here and calculates the score. We as an HMIS admin team use these reporting tools, but it's also importantly available to each agency to run their own internal operational reports um, for monitoring data quality as well, um, which we encourage and provide training on. I think that about covers it for me. Hopefully some people found peeking behind the data curtain a little interesting. Uh, really, we just want to show how grateful we are for all those people doing the hard work out there um, every day, rain or shine, even under the current circumstances, engaging with our vulnerable populations that are in need, um, the data initiators and collectors that make all of this possible. So thank you very much and mahalo. Last part of the presentation will be on the veterans dashboard. All right. So this is a dashboard that we have put together um, for you guys for this event um, and just trying to kind of show um, what we can do, hope to do, and want to continue doing. Um, so we, um, so HMIS and Josh in particular pulled um, current veteran enrollments um, as of yesterday. Um, so, just as a disclaimer, open enrollments change on a regular basis, and this is really just a snapshot of 
who's currently enrolled in our system, um, and the demographics uh, within that. Um, so we have 686 indi unique individuals um, who are enrolled. And so if we look over here at this little funnel graph on the left, um, we see the age of the individuals in the program, and we can see the majority are um, older. Um, while this is different data than the point in time count, um, it is kind of nice to see that the point in time count is reflective of actually who's using our system currently. Um, so we can see the majority of the population is between the ages of 55 and 64. Then if we look over here, we can see at the very top where we have all the little people, we have the number of individuals in each of the program enrollments. So down in the bottom, we have the legend, and if you hover over those, um, you can see which ones are highlighted. So we have BI SPDAT, Emergency Shelter, Homeless Prevention, PSH, RRH, Safe Haven, Services, Street Outreach, and Transitional. Um, so we can see the majority of our enrollments are for BI SPDAT, so there's 258. Um, and then the second largest would be our rapid rehousing. Um, so if we click on BI SPDAT, we can take that away. Um, and we can actually see in terms of um, more of the, the programs, programs that are a little bit more tangible, we can see just how large rapid rehousing makes up a portion of that. And then if we look down um, at our donut graphs down at the bottom, we can see that gender similarly um, is majority male at 88%, female at 11%, and then transgender at 0.29%. Um, and then in terms of ethnicity, this population for the majority is does not identify as Hispanic or Latino. Um, only 72 individuals identified as Hispanic. And then on the second page, we're going to look at race. Um, so this is looking at racial breakdown of individual in and by program. Um, so I know there's a lot happening right now, so we're going to just go step by step. We're going to start with the gray bar at the top. So this is the racial breakdown of all individuals regardless of their program enrollment. Um, so again, when we hover over the legend, we can highlight to see exactly what race we're looking at. Um, and again, we can see that individuals who identify as white make up the majority of the population at 33%. Um, and then we have multiracial at 18, um, almost 19%. And then African American and black at 17, roughly 18%. Now, if we look down at this um, grouped bar graph and line graph, um, this is looking at how the racial breakdown differs by each of the program enrollments. So this is taking this whole graph and then just putting it into each of the, the graphs itself. Um, so we'll start off with the white line. Um, this is the total. So this is how many um, individuals are enrolled in, currently enrolled in each of those programs. So we can hover over the dot to see specifically. So 27 for transitional housing and 53 for homeless prevention. Um, we can see this. Um, graph chart on the right, and that is um, that is for the line. And then if we look over here and we see um, 0 to 80, that is for the, the bar graph down here. So when we look over, we can see the ISPDAT, um, as noted with the line, has the most enrollment. Um, and we can see for all races, it's, it's pretty high um, and, and almost the highest for everyone except interestingly, when we look at American Indian Alaska Native, um, their actual highest enrollment is actually in rapid rehousing with nine individuals where only um, one individual has a VI spit at. And then we can see as well, um, white individuals make up the largest percentage of each of the enrollments. Um, they are the largest percentage overall. Um, so that makes a lot of sense, except for permanent supportive housing um, multiracial individuals make up the largest percentage with 22 people, um, and that's actually 17% of all multiracial individuals have a permanent supportive housing enrollment. Um, and then when we look at 
rapid rehousing, we can also see that African Americans have a really high um, proportion when looking at it, higher than the ISPADAT with 45. Um, so it's actually 37% of all African Amer American veterans um, are in rapid rehousing, whereas 25% of all white individuals are in rapid rehousing. Um, so we can see proportionally while this bar graph is is lower than the whites, but it's actually proportionally a lot larger that more African Americans are in rapid rehousing. Um, so this is just kind of, you can have, can have a play. We put this on our website um, under the HMIS dashboard, and it's, the link is on the last uh, slide of our slideshow, it's, if that becomes available. Um, and all this data is downloadable, so you can, you can have a play and you can, you can kind of see how the, the numbers break down. Okay, thank you very much, Wallace. I appreciate that. Um, so now we have a, about 12 minutes to wrap up and have a, a Q&A session. So please feel free to uh, enter questions into uh, the Q&A feature on the side, um, and we will try to address them. Uh, the first question we had actually is um, to explain what a VISPDAT is. I explained very technically uh, what it actually is, but I, I also actually, Wallace, if you could bring up the first page of the um, the dashboard uh, again, because the, there's also might be a little bit of confusion there. So if you could talk to that, why are there so many people that have a VSBDAT and nothing else? So all of those other um, people that are slotted into other program normals also had a VS but that done to them or done uh, with their um, input. Um, but can, yeah, can you speak to what the difference there is? So VS but that would make up the majority of the program enrollments and we would want to see that because in order to get into the other, um, a lot of the other housing programs or to, to get into the programs, you would want to have a VI done for the individual. Um, so that's what, that would be kind of why they would make up the largest percentage. Um, but also why I kind of like to click off of it so you can kind of see in terms of those programs that are a little bit more tangible that we can really understand like, okay, like this person is, you know, there's only 31 people who are just solely in street outreach, but there's 71 people who are in permanent supportive housing. Can somebody answer? So, what do, what does VI SPDAT stand for? Sure, oh, somebody yeah, actually put that in Vulnerability Index Service Prioritization Decision Assistance Tool. Um, actually, thank Alex you. put that in the comments there. So, thank you, Alex. I appreciate that. Uh, Violet actually had a very interesting question. So, have we noticed any major changes in the enrollments over uh, the years as time goes on? Uh, we have not looked at that, but I would love to look at that and actually see. Um, yeah, happy to definitely see how that's changed over the years. Sure. All right. So uh, there's a question about are there any uh, current plans to more easily track COVID-19 positive uh, or PUIs in HMIS to assist local communities tracking and keeping programs, veterans, and staff safe from spreading uh, COVID-19? So that that is something we are currently trying to do. Um, we do have uh, a tool out there that um, our HMIS team has designed um, that you use on your phone primarily, and it's out in the field. I think outreachers or outreach workers are the ones that are using it the most um, for different service providers, and that's basically a screening tool. Um, and that collects a lot of information there. And then from there, um, we're able to sort of map um, different conditions, different reports happening around Oahu. And then um, service providers are able to enter uh, screening information as well as other like COVID-19 testing data, like um, was their client tested? When were they tested? Have they received their results yet? Are they quarantining? Where are they quarantining? That um, that data is being collected in HMIS um, for those that are entering it. Uh, and we are encouraging 
um, folks to take advantage of that. In terms of uh, generating reports and making them public, um, I, I think that's something that we're still working on and in terms of collaborating with other agencies like Department of Health and such. Um, I just noticed a question from David. He asked to what's the difference between disability and disabling? Um, so a disabling condition is, can be qualified as, maybe it's easier to define. <laughs> disability can be like a physical disability, a developmental disability, um, or um, a chronic illness, something that impairs your ability to function from day to day. Um, so that could be a loss of a limb um, or any other kind of um, disability that hampers. Um, whereas a disabling condition is anything from substance use to mental health to disability. Um, so disabling condition is those three kind of qualifiers. Um, so we separate those out just because with um, determining chronicity, um, we need to know how long someone has been homeless for and if they have a disabling condition. Um, and that disabling condition can be substance use, um, mental health, or physical or developmental disability. And we have another question. I think this is properly for Josh, is uh, whether or not the virtual trainings for HMIS are sufficient for newly, to provide tr training for newly hired staff. Sure. Um, I mean, I think it definitely uh, comes down to the individual. Um, but for the most part, and for all the feedback that we've received, and also just based on um, people's folks' ability to be able to navigate, did they get the, the skills and the information that they needed from the training to be able to do their job? Um, and for the most part, it looks like it's, it's been really successful. Um, we do have like individual sessions set up, you know, face to face over on the laptop sometimes for anybody who's having trouble with any particular issue or need to you know, figure out how to do something if something complex arises, which happens all the time. Um, and that's part of the role of the help desk too, is like why we're here and make ourselves available is for all of the users who you know, coming into running into issues in the database, um, we want to be a support for them. Wallace, uh, I think this is a question for you. So, Gene is asking about the breakdown of female veterans and sheltered population. Um, I am just about to pull that up. So, because there's 37 um, individuals who identified as female um, in terms of the veteran population. Uh, so 37 women overall, um, and then 17 of those women were in shelter. Um, so, yeah, 20 unsheltered and 17 sheltered. Yeah, and I'm just seeing there's another question from David. We do not, um, I don't, I don't know about ye, CES, but we don't have any data on how many homeless veterans receive veteran disability payments. Um, that I'm aware of, unless Josh or Michael can state otherwise. I don't know that. Uh, and then I see something about, uh, so veterans uh, documents are difficult to obtain. Uh, when they do become document ready, will those need to be provided again in HMIS? Uh, so I think, I'll let Josh speak to the uh, ability of HMIS to house documents, uh, but we also uh, we also work with um, the CS team at the VA. Um, they they are often they are very good about uh, getting documents and getting things like the DD two fourteen and other documents from the VA. So, go ahead, Josh. Yeah, um, there's there's quite a, a broad a capability of of document storage on the database. And so for any, any of the individual client, they could have numerous documents and that it would include ones that have been up, updated over time. So in some cases, we'll maybe have like an old document and then we'll have a newer version of it. And it'll be dated when it was um, uploaded to that person's record. So you kind of be able to go off of that. 
Okay, thank you very much. Um, at this point, then I'll hand, hand it back to Ryan. Thank you, guys, and I want to thank you all for such a great presentation and going into depth about how detailed data is and what work goes into collecting it. We have reached the, the end of this session. The next sessions or the next group of sessions start at around 1045, which is about 15 minutes from now. But we thank you all for attending and enjoy the rest of day one.